Perception. What is it about perception that changes the way you feel? Think about this. You got a roller coaster ride. Most of us have been on a roller coaster ride. So two people stand in line for an hour to get on there. They get on, it takes off. The one person is just loving it. The thrill, the excitement, the intensity. The other person is hating it. He's getting sick. He's about to throw up. <clears throat> he can't wait to get off. But the one who's enjoying it, he wants it to last forever. So they both get off. And the one goes and stands in line again, even though the line's longer and it's going to take him two hours to get on there. So he can experience that one more time. <clears throat> That's where the other person says he will never get on that again. So it's a perception. One person was scared to death or very uncomfortable. The other person loved it because they each had a different perception. And I think about that in regards to politics, God. Everyone sees things differently. Everyone sees things through the filters of their experiences they have had in life. So who's right and who's wrong? You can say, let's look at the facts. Or like, that's kind of like saying an eyewitness. Eyewitnesses are very faulty because each person sees differently. Each person sees something differently, even though the facts remain the same. Each person views those facts very differently. For example, the Bible. <clears throat> we have one Bible, correct? Many books of religion throughout the world, many different faiths. But we have all the different Christian religions here in the U.S. How can that be? How can they see things so different when they're all teaching or believing from the same book? It's because of perceptions, because of the way they see things. Is it possible for two people to be right but yet have disagree or have disagreements or disagreeing perceptions or views on things? Yes, it is. Because what is right for one person may be wrong for someone else. Right and wrong also depends on the culture, the time. Many things that were wrong 50 years ago, considered wrong by the majority of people, are now considered right. And many things that were okay 50 or 100 years ago are considered wrong today. And who's to say if it won't switch back in another 50 or 100 years or 500 years. So we must be careful about what we condemn, what we judge, what we decide is right or wrong. What's right here in the US <clears throat> is very wrong in other countries around the world. And what's considered right in other countries is considered terribly wrong here. Now people get confused about judgment. Now we have to judge every day. If I'm going to hire someone, if I were an employer, I have to make a judgment whether this person will be a good fit for my company, whether the job will be a good fit for this person. I have to judge how fast I'm going. I don't always have to look at my speedometer. I have to judge if a person I'm doing business with is being honest or dishonest with me if he's telling me the whole story. But what I see today about judgment is, and it's a perception also, is that when a person thinks you're judging them or something, that it's bad. When I make a judgment on a person, I am not judging the inherent goodness or badness of that person. And hopefully you are not either. You're just judging the kind of person that you're going to be dealing with or that you don't want to deal with. I was in the uh, lumber yard yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had gone there a week before, two weeks before, and I got a price list from this guy. And I'm telling you what, when I asked him if he could price these items for me for a porch I'm building on my home, another home up in Louisa or Hannibal, he just thought I was pulling tooth. He had a grumpy attitude. He just like acted like he didn't even want to do it. I, I tell you what, when I got done there, I, did, I didn't even want to go back there. I'd been in there before and he was there, but he wasn't like this or maybe he wasn't there, I don't remember. 
So, but I went back there yesterday, and there he was again, and same grumpy face. Now, that's my perception here. And it was someone else's, too, the other guy that I dealt with. And I told him that I preferred to deal with someone other than that man. And he had told me that that's the second time he was told that today. Now, I don't think that guy's a bad person. I was just judging the fact that he's got a bad attitude. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe his wife's got cancer. Maybe he lost a child. Maybe he's an alcoholic or a drug addict. I don't know. But I decided and made a judgment that I don't want to do business with that gentleman. So I didn't say anything bad about him. I just don't want to do business with him. I told the other clerk that I preferred to do business with him. So I bought my materials and had them delivered, and that was that. So that's not, judge, judgment is not bad. We have so many words these days we use, and we actually manipulate those words, or some people do, into something that they're not. Vulnerability is another one. We have a lot of dating coaches out there that say a man needs to be vulnerable. That vulnerability is a strength. Well, if you look up the definition of the word, it is quite contrary to being a strength. So once again, someone has a perception of what that word means. Now, if you act on their perception, then you're going to be vulnerable, which is actually weak. It does not make you strong to be vulnerable. Now, to be strong means to be able to be in control of whatever you do. Basically, control of yourself. Because he who controls his self, he who controls his temper, his attitude is greater than he who takes a city. That's a quote, actually, out of the Bible. I'm not a religious guy. There's a lot of good things in the Bible, as well as probably in some of the other great religious books. And many of the things in the Bible, the wisdom that I find there, were written thousands of years before the Bible was written. Now, a lot of people don't know that. There's nothing new in the Bible that I can see as compared to some of the other things that have been written down by the wisest uh, sages of the centuries. It's just all written in a different way, maybe. But it all means the same thing. Even Jesus himself said, came, or said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. At least that's what they wrote down. <laughs> now, who knows what really he said, but what I do is I take what I need, and I, I try it, and if it works, then I use it. If not, I discard it. And that's what you need to do with anything you hear from anybody, including myself. If, if what I tell you sounds ridiculous, well, you don't have to try it, but maybe try it and see if it works. Because there have been many times in my life where someone has suggested something when I had a situation or a challenge, and I thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. But after a while, I thought, well, maybe I'll try it. And lo and behold, I tried it, and it worked. It's hard for us sometimes to take suggestions from other people, to do something a way other than what we thought of. And once again, it's a perception. We perceive that we know the best way. But many times, God has a way that we've never thought of. And there are many ways to do a thing. Your way may not be the best, but you will never know that unless you try another way. You have to be open-minded. And to be open-minded means to perceive that there may be other ways better than your way, that you don't know everything. I'll say one thing, the longer I live, the less I know. Sometimes wish I was in my teens again or early 20s when I thought I knew everything. No, I don't want to go back there. My life is great today. Don't let anybody tell you that getting, uh, or no, I'll say it this way, that living many years is, or how do they say it, is hell. <laughs> I've heard some people say it that way. It's not. It's what you make of it. It's how you perceive it. If you look at uh, living many years as being all getting old and decrepit and declining, it's all over after, what, 40 years old, they give you the black balloons, then that's what's going to be. That's your perception of reality. And you will act and experience according to your perception of reality. It's always your choice. The choice is yours. I know for me, the belief in a higher power, in a God, in a, in a creative spirit, in a, in a part of me, I believe the, the, the God I believe in lives in me, lives in everybody, lives in everything. 
I don't believe in a czar of the heavens, although there could be. If that works for you, that's fine. I used to believe in a mean and punishing God, and that didn't work very well for me. He was always up there taking notes, kind of strike me down with a lightning bolt because I did something. And, and this thing about people being born sinners, well, there's a little truth in that. Enough truth as, as, as within every lie that uh, it makes some sense. But if you look up the word sin, to sin means to miss the mark. To miss the mark means to make a mistake. Okay, so we are all born sinners. We all are born to make mistakes. And thank God for that, because without mistakes, we would never learn anything. And would life be boring if we didn't make mistakes and to suffer the consequences? And that's another thing about perception. If you look back on your life and you look at yourself as a failure because you've made so many mistakes, quite the contrary is true. If you've made a lot of mistakes, that means you've been living life, you've been trying, you've been taking risks. And hopefully, you've learned from those mistakes. You probably don't make the same mistakes you made 30 years ago or 10 years ago or maybe even last year because there are consequences to your mistakes. Maybe some pain and suffering, some remorse, some guilt, but you have to let that go. These are all just learning lessons. And to, to sin or to miss the mark does not make you a bad person. It actually makes you better because you're actually risking, you're trying, you're learning, you're growing. And that's good. You want to be growing. Everything in the universe is expanding, or at least that's what I've read. And if you're not expanding, you're contracting. And contraction leads to depression. And I see here in the U.S. we have many, many people on antidepressants. We live in the richest country ever in the history of the world. And we have some very unhappy people. Because most people are so living in comfort and pleasures that they're not risking, they're not taking chance. Oh, let's not forget about safety. Safety first. <clears throat> that they're not enjoying their life. The time you enjoy your life the most is when you're living on the edge. When you're risking it. Without risking your life, there is no reward. I'm not telling you to go out here and climb down a cliff without a rope, although some people do that, or go bungee jumping or, or parachute without a parachute. I seen a guy do that the other day, and the other guys caught him and they landed safely on the ground. But what I am telling you is to take that risk and try to achieve that God-given desire that lies within you that you've been trying to push away all your life. The thing that you want to do, but you didn't do it because you took the safe route. You got that good job. You got that mortgage. You got that family. You got that wife. You got this, this, and that. That car payment, insurance payment. You got all this insurance because you think that's going to save you in case something happens. Isn't it amazing how people got to buy years and years without insurance? Huh? But the media would have you think that life is just a risk to walk out that front door. And actually it is. I mean, you could get... Someone could come up and... And uh, I, I got to be careful what I say on YouTube. It's kind of ridiculous, but I'll just say it. Someone could have a gun out there and eliminate you. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, could be. But what are you going to do? Stay in your house the rest of your life? Let's look back on the last three or four years when we had this worldwide, how would I call it? Pandemic? Uh, I could use another word for it. But uh, fear. Fear controlled the people. And where do they get their perception from? They got their perception from the media. The, the media, the mainline media, said the same thing over and over and over again. Repetition. Do you know how they brainwash people when they catch, uh, when they have a prisoner of war? They get them in different emotional states and they tell them the same thing over and over and over again. And what did the, the media do? They had the people in a state of fear, a state of panic, and they told them the same thing over and over and over again. When a time come when they supposedly had the cure for that fear, which was an injection in the arm, I guess, uh, they flocked there to get it. Now, were they getting that to save themselves from getting a virus, or were they getting that to save themselves from getting a, from getting how would I say, to save themselves from the fear of getting the virus. 
Who said it? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Winston Churchill, is that correct? Or was that Roosevelt? And it's true. The fear is what the, what the, what the problem was. There's this old proverb, Chinese proverb. And uh, there was this gatekeeper in a big city. Thousands of people there. Maybe 100, 200,000 people. And one day the plague came to town. And asked the gatekeeper, let me in, Mr. Gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper said, I know who you are. You are the plague. I am not going to let you in because if I do, you'll kill everyone. And the plague pleaded and begged, please, Mr. Gatekeeper, I tell you what. If you let me in, I promise I will only kill 5,000 people. And as I said, there were probably 100,000 or maybe 500,000 people who lived in this gated city, this walled city, protected. So the gatekeeper thought, okay, I'll let you in. I'll let you in. It's better for 5,000 to die than if, if the plague figures out another way to get in, sneaks in, everybody will die. So he opens the gate, lets him in. Well, 10, 20 days later, here comes the plague asking the gatekeeper to open the gate again and let him out. And the gatekeeper was pissed off. He said, you lied to me, Plague. You told me you were only going to kill 5,000 people and 100,000 people have passed away. The gatekeeper, or the, the Plague smiled slyly and said, I kept my promise. I only killed 5,000 people. The others died from the fear of me. And so the gatekeeper opened the gate and let him pass. And that's what we had in the last four or five years, or from 2020 on for two or three years. The fear, the fear controlled the people of the world. Not everyone, but a lot of people, because they perceived a threat that they really didn't know it existed or not. What they, know, what they knew was they, what they were told through the media. And even if they had relatives that supposedly passed away from that, we don't know. None of us are a viro viro virologist. I can't say the word. I hope you understand. But a person that can actually, uh, a scientist that can tell these viruses. So none of us actually knew. They trusted what they heard. But yet you could ask almost anybody, do you trust your government? Do you trust government agencies? Do you trust the media? And most of them will tell you that they don't believe everything they hear, but yet they chose to believe that. They perceived through fear that there was a threat. Now, I was nervous at first. I washed my hands <clears throat> and did what I was supposed to do because I somewhat trust the government also, and I had no reason to believe that maybe this was false. And I'm not saying it was false. It just wasn't true in my perception. You can make your own choice about that. But after a while, I wasn't seeing what they were saying was going on because I was out every day. I was working. But the people that were locked up in their house, their perception was controlled by what the media told them on a screen. Mine was not. So I actually saw what I believed to be the reality of what was going on, and I didn't see much. And as time passes and more things come out about what was happening there, we see that a lot of the information was misinformation. And none of us were allowed to say anything against the narrative that was being produced around the world through the media, through the government agencies, etc. So am I wrong? I could be. I'm just telling you how I perceive things. But I know this, none of us contracted the virus. And I continued my life, I prospered, and the only people I knew that uh, I was told passed away from that virus was a friend of mine who was in the nursing home uh, who had really bad health because he did a lot of drugs, his lungs were bad. He passed away and another 90 year old woman. Oh, and another guy that passed away that was in really bad health. The only people I knew that, that passed away were really in bad health or the other woman was like 94, 95. So anything could have pushed him over the edge. But once again, I really don't know. I was told that. Uh, even a couple of my kids were tested several times when they were sick. We, we had nothing uh, according to the test. But once again, I don't know. Are those tests valid? I heard of some people taking the test and 
it didn't, uh, it, it registered that they had it, then they went back and took another one and it said they didn't have it, so how accurate were those? But once again, it all comes back to how you wanna look at the world. Perception does change, or at least create, or, or push you into the reality, or guide you into the reality you are perceiving. Now, some people will think that's ridiculous. Although they live by their perception, they don't realize it. But think about that today. How are you viewing the world? I think it was Einstein that said, what you think of the world, whether it's a beautiful world or a dangerous world, is one of the most important things or questions you can ask yourself and answer when you get up every day. Do you live in a beautiful, wonderful world? Or do you live in a scary, dark, dangerous, treacherous world? The world you see is the world it will be. Now, I know some people would argue with me. Oh, look at the wars. Look at this. There have always been wars. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. Is that part of your reality? Maybe if you watch the news, it is. I don't watch the news. Well, then some people may say, well, you're not being informed. You need to be informed. Why do I need to know about people getting brutally killed on the other side of the world? That's been happening since the beginning of time. It's not part of my experience. Do I have compassion? Do I wish there was something I could do for those people? Of course I do, but there's nothing I can do. The most important thing I can do is be the change that, that I want to see in the world. I think Gandhi said that. Everyone wants to change, or a lot of people want to change the world, but they don't want to change themselves. You can change yourself first by changing your perception of how you see things. Look for the good, the beauty, the noble, the great in everything and everybody. See more of that. And if everybody can do that, then the world will change. Because the world is a reflection of the group consciousness of the nation, of the people, of the world. Your leaders are a reflection of the group consciousness of the people in your nation. Maybe this sounds all esoteric, and it probably is, but what do you... Why not give it a shot? If you stop and think about it, everything, everything that you see, that you experience, began with a thought in someone's mind, maybe your mind, a dominant thinking pattern. Every th action is preceded by a thought, and your thoughts and beliefs are formed by your perceptions. So it really is that simple, not easy, Change your perceptions. That guy at the office that you don't like, or that girl at the office that annoys you, why don't you start looking for the good in her? There's good there. There's a little bit of good in the, in the worst of us and a bit of bad in the best of us. We are all children of God and we each have a right to be here. When I complain about you, I'm complaining about God's handiwork. I am saying that I know better than God. All the world's a stage. Men and women are merely players, and we are playing a part. What part are you going to play today? Are you going to be a light in the world? A light in the darkness? Are you going to be more dark in the inevitable darkness that you experience? Think about that today. Thanks for joining me. I'm only putting out about one video a week because I am busy, busy with my other company. But I want to keep in touch with you guys. Uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Hit that like button if you benefited from this. Share it with a friend if you think it will help them. And thanks again for being here for me. And I hope this is, uh, hope this is a great day for you.